Professor Sir Peter Ratcliffe is the Director of Clinical Research at the Francis Crick Institute in London and the Director of the Target Discovery Institute at University of Oxford. He's a medical doctor and trained as nephrologist. He is a Fellow of the Royal Society in London. Dr. Ratcliffe studied medicine at the University of Cambridge with clinical practice at Bartholomew's Hospital in London, and he obtained his medical degree in 1978. He worked at different postgraduate hospitals in London for a few years and thereafter relocated to Nuffield Department of Medicine at Oxford University to train in nephrology. In 1987, he presented his MD thesis that, were fo that was focused around renal oxygenation. Dr. Ratcliffe was to stay at Nuffield Department of Medicine for many years, and in 2004, he became the Nuffield Professor and Head of Nuffield Department of Medicine, University of Oxford, and these positions he has held until 2016. Having mostly been involved in clinical studies and studies on renal uh, physiology in rats, Dr. Ratcliffe obtained a senior fellowship from the Wellcome Trust in 1919 for research on an entirely new topic, oxygen sensing. And since then, Dr. Ratcliffe has continuously contributed in clinical research, renal physiology, and of course, most importantly, to the mechanism of oxygen sensing and its therapeutic opportunities. Among his vast contributions to science, Dr. Ratcliffe placed one hippelinda protein at the center stage of oxygen sensing, and he discovered the biochemical link between oxygen availability and oxygen sensing. I ask you all to join me in welcoming Professor Sir Peter Ratcliffe to the stage where he will deliver his 2019 Nobel Prize lecture. Thank you very much indeed, Patrick, for that kind introduction. Thank you also to the Nobel Assembly for this very great honour. I should like to begin um, this lecture, since Greg, Bill and I are an Anglo-American trio, with the Anglo-American expedition to Pikes Peak, Colorado, to study altitude, that's hypoxia, adaption a little over a hundred years ago. The expedition was led by John Scott Haldane on the left there, but the heroine for this lecture was surely Mabel Fitzgerald, the only female member of the expedition, not allowed to be a member of Oxford University on account of her, her gender. But here she is with the men at the summit of Pikes Peak, where there was a very comfortable hotel uh, to base their laboratory. But the decision was that Fitzgerald should work elsewhere to make uh, measurements at intermediate altitude uh, in the surrounding mining towns. The story is that this is because the men were uncomfortable that she was unchaperoned in that comfortable hotel. Uh, but off she went uh, on her own to visit those towns that were more or less the Wild West. And these are the measurements she made. Um, 
on, on the top there of breathing uh, and below uh, of changes in the blood, in each case showing uh, the very uh, sensitive changes in each of those parameters to small changes in altitude and hence oxygen. Uh, this wasn't the first demonstration of adaptation, but I think it was the first demonstration of the extraordinary sensitivity of the hypoxia pathway uh, that we're going to discuss uh, this afternoon. Um, the changes in the blood uh, were, as, as Greg has alluded to, um, uh, mediated by the hormone erythropoietin. And here again, looking uh, directly at EPO, uh, we can see that extraordinary sensitivity here, uh, just a donation of a unit of blood. EPO's made in the kidney. Uh, as you've heard, I, I'm a, a kidney specialist by training. And this was this extraordinary sensitivity uh, that drew me uh, to the subject to find out uh, what was uh, the oxygen sensor. Uh, now, as Greg indicated, there was a new opportunity for us at this time, since the EPO gene had been cloned. Uh, we were able, uh, we thought, to go outwards from the EPO gene progressively uh, to that sensor, and, and I'm going to describe uh, my own lab's uh, experience in, in, in that journey. We imagined that we would be moving out to uh, an extremely uh, specialized sensor in extremely specialized cells just within the kidney, uh, which sense oxygen and, 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 uh, and made EPO. Uh, the only problem was that those cells uh, were not identified in the kidney uh, and were not available in a convenient tissue culture dish uh, for, our, for our studies. So we, we tried to make them grow out of kidney by uh, expressing a trans, uh, an oncogene, T antigen, to make the cells proliferate and grow out of kidney. Um, uh, this experiment did I identify the cells uh, along uh, with the work of, of uh, Kai Eckhart. Uh, uh, here, uh, the, the rather nice immunohistochemistry in, in my lab from Patrick Maxwell, I, I identified not, not as particularly, not as one of the interesting cells of the kidney, not obviously specialized, the, the rather humble fibroblasts but still they wouldn't behave in growing tissue culture. Um, so uh, great credit uh, should go to Franklin Vaughan, who identified in some hepatoma cells, a uh, hepatoma from the liver, the other organ makes EPO, that made EPO in tissue culture, and importantly increased it uh, very much uh, in, 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 in low oxygen. Uh, and, and those were the cells um, uh, that we, and, and uh, Greg's alluded to the work in his lab, first used uh, to try to map the control sequences at the erythropoietin gene as a first step in that journey, which we knew must inter interact with the, with the upstream uh, sensing mechanism. Uh, and this was our work um, on, on the mouse gene, uh, identifying that uh, three prime enhancer that could confer oxygen regulation on a reporter gene and hence must up uh, interact with the upstream uh, uh, apparatus. Uh, Chris Pugh and I worked night and day uh, on, on these extremely cumbersome uh, RNAs protection assays that you, you see here that demonstrated that, that first step. Um, but then I wanted to take a shortcut. I, I, I wanted to be clever and expression clone the upstream bits of the hypoxia signaling pathway by, by transferring um, uh, genes from cells that had oxygen sensing, uh, that was Frank's hepatoma cell, uh, to one that didn't. Um, that would be uh, every other cell. And, and uh, to my surprise and initial irritation, uh, the con it was necessary to show the con the, 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 this cell, the control cell, didn't have the property uh, in the first place. And to my surprise and in initial irritation, um, that was not the case. We found the control cell had the property also. Uh, now, um, 
Patrick uh, Maxwell took this work on, and, and here are some of the protection assays that Patrick did. Uh, and they show that every uh, cell, in fact, uh, that we tested ultimately on the right conditions had this property. Uh, and we realized that th this was of pretty substantial significance, since it implied that extraordinarily sensitive system that had been shown first by Fritz Gerald and then by those EPO uh, w w w would be... Um, was present in all cells, which must be doing other things since they don't make EPO. They must be regulating other genes in that way. Um, so I was very excited by the work and, um, and wrote it up. And um, not one to take a chance. I, I drove with the manuscript to the offices of a very famous journal in London. And uh, my aim was to burst in and... and, and uh, see an editor, and uh, I, I believe the editor would immediately see the extraordinary significance of this work, like myself, and um, agree to publish the work. Um, this is Monday, Thursday, the day before Easter. Agree to be publish it immediately after Easter. Um, hmm. This is the letter we received uh, about four months later on. And... Um, even for the young people, if they ever say this to you, we had difficult, great difficulty finding reviewers. This is good. <laughs> this means you're in quite a small field. It's going to make life a lot easier for you. Uh, anyway, that, that was the, the, the first bit of, of, of my story. Um, uh, Greg did the magnificent work, magnificent work that you've heard of, uh, of, of, of identifying uh, HIF uh, that, that binds to that sequence. Uh, we, we met um, in the Lake uh, Lucerne Palace Hotel shortly after this sadness, and he, he published for the first time, uh, he, he, he presented for the first time unpublished work on his identification of uh, of HIF in, in those hepatoma cells. And I, I presented uh, the work that I've just described to you. Uh, here we are um, at the uh, uh, eagerly, eagerly contemplating the way forward. Do not be deceived by this photograph. The, the Lake Lucerne Palace Hotel was the most luxurious place either of us had ever seen before. Uh, and we're ever likely to see again uh, uh, until we came here. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, we, we, we went back to Oxford, and, and of course the question was, what were the other genes? And, 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 and this, was, this was our uh, attempt on it. Um, the uh, phosphoglycerate kinase gene, a glycolysis implied in... And individual metabolism, and there is, uh, is HIF binding the phosphoglycerate kinase uh, promoter. So, uh, glycolysis, of course, is uh, uh, some people will know conserved uh, throughout evolution. So, we were keen uh, to go back and look in more primitive species. Was, was HIF there too? Uh, and this was uh, another piece of work identifying it in the uh, fly cells, uh, Drosophila, fruit fly, uh, SL2 cells. You can see that rather clear HIF there. We, we still weren't making much impact with our editorial friends. Uh, this paper ha had the distinction of being first lost uh, and then rejected uh, by an editor of the, the Journal of Biology and Chemistry. Um, but but it, it, the, the, the story in invertebrates uh, is important, so I'll come to uh, l later on. Um, uh, as you heard uh, very nicely from Greg, the, the field exploded uh, and uh, whole new realms of uh, understanding of hypoxia biology uh, uh, f following uh, these, these discoveries uh, and uh, entirely new fields, and I, I've set them out just there. Um, but um, at the time, we, we wanted to go upstream from, from HIF, and, and Greg had importantly identified the encoding genes. So it was possible uh, to uh, ask what aspects of HIF conveyed oxygen uh, sensing, and... Um, 
Uh, we, uh, Greg and others, uh, fused uh, bits of the, the HIF to an artificial transfection factor, what, what would confer oxygen sensitivity. We, we found these three regions would, would all do it. So each of them had to interact with this up, upstream process uh, and then uh, be transduced uh, uh, from the sensor to a, a piece of sequence. Now, everyone knew, everyone knew that uh, protein phosphorylation was the means of signal transduction. So there had to be a phosphoacceptor amino acid in each of those regions to receive the signal. Um, but Chris Pugh uh, I, uh, mutated every phosphoacceptor in this region, it made not a bit of difference at all. Uh, th th this work wasn't, also wasn't all that popular, uh, since it was entirely negative. Um, but but it, it did exclude the mainstream hy hypothesis. So, so what did those sequences uh, I I interact with? It turns out they, they inter there's the ones that interact with the von Hippel-Lindau uh, gene. And, uh, uh, well, this was a eureka moment in, in my lab. Um, in, in VHL defective cells, uh, if it's stabilized, and if you put VHL back in, it, it gains that oxygen-sensitive property. Uh, but, you know, knowledge builds on knowledge, and this eureka moment d didn't happen just out of the blue. Other people uh, contributed importantly to the creation of that knowledge, importantly uh, Bill here. But um, uh, Greg and I and others were, were finding these multiple transcripts you, you've heard about. Uh, Bill uh, and others noticed uh, uh, that they were constitutively upregulated in, in these VHL defective cells uh, from, from, uh, from kidney cancer, uh, and uh, they were upregulated irrespective of oxygen. But puzzlingly, they, they didn't identify the mechanism. Uh, we heard about the work in, in Sheffield uh, on a rainy day. It rains hard in Sheffield town in the, in the north of England. Uh, we, we rushed back to Oxford, uh, obviously to blot for HIF. And uh, this is what we found. Very puzzling. And uh, I presume it was puzzling in Bill's lab too. Um, another strand of work, um, Steve McKnight was looking for for other pass proteins in the human genome. Um, he, he found uh, something that might have been a, a, a paralog of HIF, called it EPAS, endothelial pass protein. Um, but it needed an antibody to demonstrate whether it's oxygen sensitive or not. Uh, Patrick Maxwell uh, in the lab made one, PM9, Patrick Maxwell 9. and. Um, <laughs> Uh, Patrick Maxwell 9 uh, was, was responsible for this blot uh, and the derulement. Uh, actually, these particular cells, many of them only express HIF2, and, and uh, that's the demonstration why the blot was initially uh, blank. So uh, th this experiment had quite a number of uh, uh, important outputs. Uh, Amongst other things, I, I won't have time for this, but wh why does is the, does the distortion to HIF2 in, in RCC? As I think Bill will allude to, uh, HIF2 is now a target for RCC, uh, but importantly for this uh, uh, lecture, it, it was one step further along the oxygen sensing pathway. Um, uh, VHL is a ubiquitin ligase, and uh, in the presence of oxygen, uh, it, it destroys uh, HIF, and in the absence, HIF builds up. Uh, a lot of this work in, in my lab being uh, Norma Masson and, and uh, Matthew Cockman uh, following on. So that gave us a biochemical question. Um, what was the nature of that in that extract that caused these two proteins to bind together? And um, he, here we needed to, to correct a, a glitch, uh, and this was the very uh, important and beautiful work of Panu Yakala here and, and, and David uh, Mole. Uh, we had noticed that the uh, association was broken by cobalt, GFO. Uh, these are compounds that mimic hypoxia, but apparently not by hypoxia itself. That, that was very puzzling to us. Um, 
why not oxygen? Uh, uh, Andrew uh, Skin from Baker Ruskin visited the lab and, and sold me a hypoxia workstation. I had a bit of spare money from the Wellcome Trust, uh, which, which is quite important. That's, that's a plug to the scientists to have spare money. And we, we bought that um, thing and... Um, Panu and David were then able to re-perform the immunoprecipitations with all the buffers equilibrated to hypoxia uh, uh, and, uh, performed the, and, and then we understood that the, the reaction was indeed uh, oxygen dependent. So it, it had these characteristics of oxygen and iron dependent. Uh, it wasn't ATP dependent, consistent with with the absence of, of any evidence for protein phosphorylation in the signaling pathway. Um, and um, we, we were always suspicious of a particular prolapse to you, uh, but this is one of the moments you live for. Um, we, we made, um, ultimately, a peptide with the uh, proline residue hydroxylated, and, and you see here with beautiful clarity uh, that you no longer need to treat uh, the extract then, uh, the, 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 the Via the HIF then with extract uh, binds uh, uh, to VHL uh, very powerfully uh, in any case. This, uh, this was the work of Yamin Tian. And uh, it, it had a, a great significance because that was the, uh, the evidence that likely the uh, modification was, was hydroxylation of proline and that immediately suggested an oxygen sensing uh, mechanism uh, through uh, prolyl hydroxylases which consume oxygen and, and Bill will, will tell his side of that story. We, we, uh, a little bit more fortunate with the editors these days. Uh, we publish those papers back to back in, in science. Um, so, so um, what was the, what, what was the, this was the position then that um, uh, it was known that the collagen prolyl hydroxylases, uh, oxygen splitting enzymes, they require iron and cobalt. Um, which were those hypoxia mimetics. Uh, so we're in some ways rather good candidates anyway, but we couldn't believe the collagen prolyl hydroxylases could, could do it. Uh, amongst other things, the sequence was wrong, and uh, Johanna Mulleru uh, from uh, Finland uh, was able to exclude that for us uh, biochemically. So um, uh, what were the enzymes was the next question. And... Um, uh, knowledge builds on knowledge, so this is another curious one. Uh, we met up with this guy, uh, Chris Schofield, who was to become a, a very valued long-term collaborator. Now, Chris was working on two oxyglutrate oxygenases, but not the collagen enzymes, quite a different thing. He was studying enzymes involved in antibiotic synthesis, and, and there's one of the first structures. Uh, that uh, triad of iron coordinating residues uh, was the signature that enabled him uh, to predict uh, uh, other members of this uh, uh, family, I including some that might be prolyl hydroxylases. In the meantime, um, others have been working uh, on uh, mutant C. elegans worms, 145 catalogued mutated worms that couldn't lay eggs. That was the subject of this paper by Bob Horowitz, a previous recipient of this honor. Um, egg laying, well, uh, a neural, uh, neurosecretory, neuromuscular defect. What could that possibly have to do with what we were looking for? But they catalogued all those mutants. Now, earlier I told you we looked for, for HIF in, 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 in flies. Uh, John O'Rourke in the lab uh, also look for it in worms, in C. elegans worms. And this time, uh, critically, he, he made an antibody. Uh, and this is that antibody, rather beautifully showing uh, regulation by uh, oxygen in the worms. Uh, Andy Epstein took this, uh, took this project on, and, and he... Um, uh, looked at all sorts of worms. Uh, you don't need a license, uh, no expertise, poor worms. They all went in that uh, bell jar, uh, and none, all of them responded to hypoxia in the, in the way that you see. Uh, but one of Chris's mutants, Eggle 9, look at that, uh, completely constitutive 
Hiff. I can remember Andy Edstein bursting through the office door saying, here's your gene. And uh, another of those moments you, you live for, it sure was, uh, one of Chris's candidates, Egel 9, is the prolyl hydroxylase that we're, we're talking about, the, the oxygen sensor. Uh, so um, uh, that's the, the system, uh, simply a, a regulatory oxygen-splitting enzyme uh, that adds an oxygen atom to the proline ring. The alcohol group here then hydrogen bonds to VHL uh, and uh, uh, degrades HIF in, in the presence of oxygen. That's the switch that regulates all those responses you've heard about from Greg. That's the that Fitzgerald first noted in those uh, Wild West mining towns in Colorado. Um, here she is again, uh, both the uh, acclimatized increased breathing sensitivity to ox uh, oxygen uh, and the hemoglobin response, uh, both uh, the result of switching uh, the HIF. Uh, and, and we can see here uh, the carotid body that does those uh, breathing responses uh, expressing HIF uh, protein and lots of HIF mRNA uh, and those uh, lowly uh, fibroblasts in the kidney uh, uh, expressing HIF and, and doing the uh, hemoglobin response. Uh, that, that, that work. Uh, of uh, other female scientists in the lab, Tammy Bishop, Emma Hodson, uh, and Johanna Lima. Uh, so, um, from EPO to oxygen, uh, there we are. Um, uh, but we learned so much more uh, along the way. Um, all of these unexpected uh, uh, aspects of oxygen physiology, and that two oxyglutrate, the co-substrate, you make an analog of that, and it makes a drug uh, that can be used for therapeutic manipulation of this system. I, I'll f finish um, uh, w with that at the end. But um, in, in the last part of the talk, I, I want to talk about some new work. Um, HIF, uh, prolyl hydroxylase VHL, in that assembled form, appears only to be present in animals, in, in metazoan uh, life. But um, it's since become clear that, that all four eukaryotic uh, kingdoms uh, apparently use this rather odd system of of enzymatic uh, protein oxidation coupled to proteostasis uh, to signal oxygen levels, but in in somewhat different ways. So here is the, uh, the system in animal cells I've just described to you. Here is the system in process in uh, Dictostelium, the very nice work of Chris West. It's similar but a little different in the ligase is the target of hydroxylation, not the substrate of the ligase. Here is the system in fish and yeast, the very nice work of Peter Espenshader. Here are different prolyl hydroxylase uh, responding on a different transcription factor involved in the sterol response. Uh, but, but this is one I want to finish with. It's slightly different in, in, in plants. Uh, plants, uh, this is a very nice work of, uh, of uh, Francesco Lacosi, um, who showed that plants use a different enzyme, cysteine uh, oxidases, to uh, dioxygenate an N-terminal cysteine in ethylene response factors, the sort of plant equivalent of HIF uh, that enables the plant to uh, make responses to, to things like flooding. If you overwater and kill your plants, you're probably killing them uh, through hypoxia. And, and this is the way the plants try to adapt if you overwater them. Uh, they they uh, um, uh, r r inhibit the destruction of those transcription factors to bring on their own adaptive responses. So uh, the work in our lab on this comes from a chance meeting uh, uh, fr with Francesco uh, in Rome. Uh, Francesco wanted, uh, asked me if he could express the animal system in plant cells as an exogenous uh, indicator of, of hypoxia. I said, why don't we uh, uh, express the, the plant system in animal cells and, and see what happens? Um, 
and, and, and this is the, the, the very nice work of Norman Mass and Tom Keeley and, and Beatrice uh, Guntoli, uh, in, who came over from Francesco's lab. Uh, they fused um, that, that um, plant um, ethylene response factor sequences to a, a reporter. And uh, to our surprise, uh, when expressed in human cells, even without the plant oxygen sensing enzyme, it, it behaved in an oxygen sensitive way. And, and there you can see uh, in, induction by, by hypoxia. The, the, the characteristics are different from HIF, but there it was. Um, and when we mutated that target cysteine residue here, uh, we, we saw, you can see that it doesn't respond, it, it's constitutive stabilized, uh, as we've seen in some of the, the, the HIF system. Uh, so uh, the implication was there's a human enzyme, the same as that plant uh, enzyme, doing the, the same thing. And um, I, I hope you, you'll like this experiment. I, I love it as a human uh, cell biologist and physician uh, conducted in Francesco's uh, lab. Uh, the, the, these are the uh, Arabidopsis uh, seedlings, and, and this is one with the uh, uh, four of the five plant cysteine oxidases uh, knocked out. It's looking uh, rather poorly. Uh, we uh, identified the human enzyme and Francesco expressed that in the plants. And there we go, made the plants uh, better, beautiful complementation. So ADO is the human ortholog of the uh, plant uh, oxygen sensor, uh, another um, uh, uh, type of uh, human oxygen sensor, and w this is work in progress. We, we don't know how important that will be at the moment. We don't know uh, whether there'll be medicine behind it, uh, but it does have some uh, rather interesting uh, uh, targets. The, the regulator of G protein, and you, you can see here uh, that uh, in the ADO knockout cell, that protein is stabilized. Uh, and when we look at G protein signaling in the ADO knockout cell, the regulator, the down regulator, is up, and the G protein signals are, are down. This is the very nice work of, of Tom uh, Keeley. Uh, so uh, that, that, that's, uh, that, that's coming to the end now. Um, I, I, I've, uh, and Greg, shown you this uh, uh, amazing uh, human oxygen sensor doing hundreds or thousands of things. I've drawn it in a very simplified way. Uh, we've um, alluded to the plant system, which, which is uh, also very complicated, but works in a different way. Um, it has a reflection in, in animal uh, cells. Um, and then, interesting enough, what I didn't show you, HIF, um, uh, it actually also interacts with those RGS proteins. And every time we look at HIF, we find a, a, another realm of complexity seems to interact with the acute oxygen sensing system. So out of all that, how could you get the little bit you want to treat a human disease specifically? How, how can you get what you want? Think about that. Um, but in fact, and Bill will go through this, the, the results of, the, of, uh, of giving those hydroxyl oxalase inhibitors in kidney patients are, are pretty promising. There's newer data from this. So, so far, these inhibitors show powerful effects on renal anemia with little evidence of general activation against that expectation. Uh, so um, you can't always get what you want, but if you try, sometimes you find you get what you need. Uh, the words of Sir Michael Jagger and Mr. Keith Richards, of course, by repute, they knew a bit about drug uh, discovery. And um, what, what, what they meant was that there was an element of empiricism of trial and error in, in obtaining uh, drugs. That molecular biology, we can take it so far, deliver the targets, uh, but you have to embrace that, that, that slight uncertainty. Uh, but um, as Bill will explain, uh, it's looking pretty good at, at the moment for, for these drugs. Um, uh, I should thank a, a lot of people here uh, past, not quite as many as Greg, I think, but uh, uh, people past and, and, and present in, in my lab. Uh, the current group here, uh, very many thanks to them, a sunny day in, in Oxford. Um, uh, the funders, um, 
are very important. Uh, the Wellcome Trust and Oxford University have been with me throughout uh, this time. The Ludwig Cancer Research uh, uh, for uh, the uh, cancer work we, we, we now do. Uh, importantly at the moment, the, the European Research uh, Council, very valuable little message from, from Britain, let's, let's stay together. Uh, all, all, all these things uh, are important. Three very important people uh, I've uh, mentioned, Chris Pugh, Patrick Maxwell, uh, Christopher Schofield. And finally, my wife Fiona, uh, I've summarised uh, 30 years work in 30 minutes, so I just gave you the good bits. Uh, there have been uh, bad bits to it, and Fiona has to suffer uh, them, um, which she does very kindly. Um, my family, um, and finally, my extended family, who arrived just a couple of days after the call from Thomas Perlman. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.